Well, I hope your Christmas season is off to a good start, and I hope that our time in God's Word today uh, will add to that. We're in the midst of a series we're calling The Songs of Christmas, and we're studying those occasions in the Bible where people were confronted with the truth of Jesus as it related to the Christmas uh, season, and in the midst of the narrative, they burst out into spontaneous praise to God. Really, they burst out in songs to the Lord. Last week, we studied Elizabeth. She was Mary's older cousin. She was the wife of a priest by the name of Zacharias. And if you missed her story, you can go back on our website. We have all these messages posted, and you can hear more about it. But naturally, her story was connected to that of her husband. And before we jump today into the song of Zacharias, her husband, I want to take a few moments just to give you a bit of the backstory. So we're going to get to Luke chapter 1 and verse 68 in a moment, but let me just kind of paint the picture for you, give you a bit of the backstory of Zacharias. It was the biggest day in his ministry life. The pinnacle of serving as a priest was the privilege of serving in the very holiest part of the temple. And history tells us that a priest got to do that exactly one time. One time. After that, you were done. You'd, you'd served your one time. They would serve, of course, in the temple and, and do many other important things every day, but only once in the life of a priest would they have the privilege of serving in the holiest part of the temple. In Luke 1, verses 8 through 10, the, the Bible says this, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. The Bible mentions that a priest would get this special privilege by, by way of, of a lot, and we would say drawing straws. And again, after you had your turn, it was done. So for Zacharias, today we're going to study, it was a big, big day for him, the biggest day in his ministry life. And while he is doing this incredible work, ministering, serving God, and serving the people in the midst of this incredible time, an angel appears to him. Now, that would always be a shocking thing. I've never personally seen an angel that I know of. The Bible does say sometimes we entertain angels unaware, so maybe uh, I've seen one and didn't know it, but I've, I've never knowingly seen an angel. It would be shocking if I did, but the message the angel brought was also shocking. Verses 13 and 14 here in Luke 1, the Bible says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not. Have you noticed the angels always begin by saying, Fear not? Why is that? We'd probably be terrified if we saw an angel, okay? So the first thing I got to say is, Relax, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I've got good news here. Uh, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. He goes on to share that his son, whom he's to name John, is going to be used greatly of God to turn many people to the Lord. And in that moment, as Zacharias hears, uh, hears this message from the angel, he responds by saying this, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. To all the men here today, I just want to say, it's not in my notes, but I feel led to uh, interject this. Never refer to a woman as being stricken in years, okay? He said, for me, I'm an old guy. My wife, dude, she's been stricken by these years, okay? So not good. But at any rate, uh, he says to the angel, wait a minute, you're saying we're going to have kids? You don't understand. I'm an old guy. My wife, man, she's really old. She's been stricken by these years. In other words, he's saying we're kind of past that stage of life. So his immediate response to this message is doubt. Response to that, we read in verses 19 and 20, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel. He's saying, hey, listen up, buddy. We only know the names of a couple angels in the Bible. We think of Gabriel and, and Michael. And this angel says, hey, listen here, Mr. Priest, man. I'm Gabriel. Does that name ring a bell to you? I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. The angel said, all right, you're going to doubt. You're going to be dumb, unable to speak. We later read that he would communicate by writing things down, and so he wrote some things down to share with his wife what was going on, and for the duration of her pregnancy, he was silent. Wives, how many of you think it'd be nice to have a son who's, or a, a husband, rather, who's periodically dumb? Would that be good? 
How many of you would say, I've got a husband who's dumb right now. He's dumb all the time, all right? And uh, so we've got this priest. He doubts this angel bringing a message from God, and, and so he's unable to speak for the duration of his wife's pregnancy. He didn't say a word, but finally the day comes when his son is born. Obviously, he was so excited. The people began to ask Elizabeth, what, what are you going to name him? It was the custom to name it after a family member. And Elizabeth says, we're going to name him John. And the people protest. They're like, wait, there's no John in your family. You can't name him John. Well, it's in that moment when it happened. In verses 63 and 64 here of Luke 1, the Bible says, and he, speaking of this prophet Zechariah, uh, it says, he asked for a writing table and wrote saying, his name is John. They marveled all. They were surprised. They're like, wow, this is unusual for him to be named John. And, and his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed and he spake and praised God. Now the song is going to come, but I wanted you to get the backstory. The first thing he can do when he was physically able in response to the unfolding drama of the Christmas narrative was to praise God. These spontaneous songs of praise that we're studying have been given Latin names. For example, Mary's is called the Magnificat. Uh, the song of the angels that we're going to uh, consider is Gloria in Excelsis. This song that Zacharias the priest sings is called Benedictus. Now, I know we don't speak Latin, but sometimes names stick. We, we drive every day on streets that have Spanish names, and there are a lot of people in our area that speak Spanish, but the name stuck, and so we keep it. And, uh, and Benedictus. Why Benedictus? Well, uh, that's the Latin word for our word, Blessed. And that's where this man's song began, with the word blessed. I want us to listen to this song of praise. If you're able today, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing, out of respect for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, and with that background in mind, we'll pick it up now in verse 68. Zacharias says in verse 68, Benedictus, the first word, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, I want you to notice he's directing his, his remarks now to his son. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. I want you to go back in the midst of verse 76. Notice that expression, the prophet of the highest. The prophet of the highest. Our Father, we're grateful to be in this place today to open your word. God, I pray that as well as opening your word, we'd open our hearts to the truths that we find here. Uh, bring encouragement, Lord, from our time together today. Help us to learn and to grow. Help us not just to gather facts from the scriptures, but to uh, really find truths whereby we can live for you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. They say that a baby changes everything, and that is absolutely the truth. I've got to tell you, in my experience, I would add to that statement by saying a baby changes everything for the better. I love being a dad. I absolutely love it. Uh, for me, family's my favorite. I love being a dad. I love now being a granddad and watching little Callie up here a minute ago. Uh, that made this day a great one for me. It's wonderful to have a family, and I thank God for my children. When Jessica, our oldest daughter, was a baby, I'd often walk into her room at night and just stare at her. Just stare at her. Now, I hope to not offend anyone with what I'm going to say next, but I think some of you will understand what I'm about to say. To that point in my life, I'd never actually thought babies were cute. 
<laughs> Everyone would say, oh, look at that baby, isn't it cute? And I always kind of thought, they're kind of weird a little bit, you know? They're just kind of squirming and all the time doing weird things and, and crying all the time. And, and I never really thought they were cute. But man, when I looked at Jessica, I thought, she's perfect. She's absolutely perfect. Before uh, she even would understand a word that I would say to her, I would speak into her ear, you're going to do great things in life. I'm going to help you every chance I get. I believe in you. I just was so thankful to have this little child in my life and to know I would have the joy of, of being her dad. No single event in my life made me so completely forget about myself, like becoming a father. My biggest dreams from that point on were that her dreams in life would come to fruition. I think most parents feel that way. We have hopes and dreams for what our kids could become and what they will maybe do. We want what's best for them. If our pain can lead to their gain, then we're happy to hurt. Everything changes. But I want you to imagine getting a message from God by way of the angel Gabriel that your child was going to have a hand literally in changing the world. Now, I don't mean change the world in the sense that we're all a part of the world and our presence makes one 7.6 billionth of a difference. I'm talking about the kind of difference that literally changes everything for every person. I, I think if that announcement were made to us by way of an angel, it would get our attention. And certainly it got the attention of, of Zacharias. This old priest had not said anything for nine months, but he was compensated for that time by having the opportunity to, to open his mouth and to praise God. His son had been chosen by God to prepare the way for the promised one in the Old Testament, the, the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, John the Baptist, this, this baby who'd been born was going to serve God in a special way. The first part of the praise that was given by this priest, Zacharias, was emphasizing the, the goodness of God and how God keeps his word and how God is a redeeming savior. But in the closing verses, he, he turns this remark, it's still praise to God, but he's speaking to his son. Obviously, his son's a little baby, he doesn't know what's being said, but it's kind of like when I was whispering in Jessica's ear as a baby saying, you're going to do great things in life. We've got a dad here looking at his son and, and he's moved by God. And, and so he's speaking to his son and that begins really in about verse 76. And so for our study today, I want to focus in on that part. We discover what was being said and what it meant. I think we're going to find a relevant application for our lives today. So with these words in mind, what do we see? The first element we see here is this. Number one, the way needed to be prepared. The way needed to be prepared. Let's look in verse 76. Zacharias proclaimed this. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Now, this baby named John would come to be known as John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is considered the last prophet. He, he really is in the New Testament, but he's tied to the Old Testament times. It was the end of an era, and we would consider him to be the last prophet. His role was unique in the sense that, as his father said, he was to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Sometimes we call John the Baptist a forerunner to Jesus Christ. That exact word isn't used in the Bible, but certainly the idea is. And, and uh, uh, we know that a forerunner was very important to a king. What the forerunner did for a king is he would go ahead to prepare the way. He would make sure the path was clear. He'd make sure that, that the place the king was going to visit was ready so the people could be there to receive him appropriately. And, and he was kind of setting things up for the king. And John the Baptist did that for the king of kings, Jesus Christ. By definition, a prophet of God would foretell God's word to the people. Here's how it worked for a long, long time. God would have a message for his people. There would be a man of God, and God would share that message with that person, that prophet, who then would go to the people and say, hey, people, I've got a message from God. God told me to tell you. He, he was delivering God's message. He was kind of the paper boy, if you would. It wasn't his news. He was delivering the news from God. And John the Baptist was a prophet in that sense. He had a message from God to deliver to the people. Today, we don't need a prophet in that sense. In fact, I would say this. I don't want to be unkind today, but if anybody tells you they have a unique message from God that God specifically gave to them for you, I wouldn't pay any attention to it at all. Because a prophet in the Bible sense was someone who would foretell the words of God. 
But today, we know that we are all prophets in a sense. Not like John the Baptist in another sense. We're not foretelling the words of God. We are forthtelling the word of God. We don't have to make up a message today. God's given us what it is we need to know. And so we know that similar to John, we're not foretelling, but we have God's word and it's our job to share it with others. Did you know like John the Baptist, we have been called to prepare the way for Jesus Christ? We've been called to live in this world in such a way that that kind of removes barriers, that makes it easier for people to come to know who Jesus is. I want you to listen how Isaiah in the Old Testament talked about the work that John the Baptist would do in the New Testament. In Isaiah chapter 40, he said this, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. He said in a sense, hey, if there's a low spot, a pothole, fill that in. If there's a barrier, get that out of the way. If the road's meandering, make it straight, make it plain, make it easy for people to come to the place where they can see who Jesus is. In the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 3, we read this, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, John the Baptist had a unique role of setting the stage for the Christ of Christmas. He made the preparations necessary so that when people encountered Jesus, he could introduce them and they would understand, oh, this is the one that the prophets before have all spoken of. In fact, in the Gospel of John, we read this. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. John the Baptist said, what's my job? My job is to tell people, get ready. Jesus is coming. You're going to want to meet him. And Friends, I want you to know this today. Like John, we can prepare those around us in this Christmas season to come to know Jesus. How can we do that? Well, there are a lot of ways. I'll tell you one way we can do that. I'm going to do my best next week to stand up and deliver as clear a gospel presentation as I possibly can. And if we'll do something like invite a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member to come to a place where, where the music's going to emphasize the truth of Jesus, where the sermon is going to emphasize the truth of Jesus and, and the clear gospel message. What you're doing is you're inviting people to a place like that as you're preparing the way. You're, you're making it so that they can come and hear, hear and, and learn. We can in, invite people to come over to our homes after the service to make it personal. We can use our lives in so many ways to make a big deal about that which matters most. And that which matters most is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and savior several years ago our church had a guest i was really really excited about Uh, we had here as as a guest ac green who was a former laker great and i don't follow sports like i did at one time but man years ago i was as big a laker fan as you'd find anywhere and back in the in the heydays of of the showtime laker era ac green was just an absolute stud they call him the iron man no one no one played in more consecutive games than ac green he was just he was just a beast, man, and I, I enjoyed watching him. And so A.C. Green was going to come to our church. Well, I want you to know, we did a lot of preparing. I said, look, I want the place to look good. Let's clean it up. Let's make sure it looks good outside, it looks good inside. Let's do all we can. And we began to organize things, and we began to prepare for his coming. We invited people in every which way we could, and I encourage you guys to invite people. i got to tell you, I talked to everybody in my life and said, you're not going to believe it, A.C. Green. He's coming to our church. You need to be here. You're going to have an opportunity to meet him. And, and I was so excited A.C. Green was coming. Now, i got to give the caveat here. What made his coming extra special is the fact that he was coming to share with our church how he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And, and uh, we were all glad to hear that story. But, but I think it's fair if we ask this question. Does A.C. Green deserve more excitement and preparation than Jesus Christ? Well, of course he doesn't. Jesus deserves our best. 
No, we're not John the Baptist, but thankfully we can join John the Baptist in the work of preparing people to meet Jesus. That can be done in so many ways, but as it relates to the Christmas season, this is an opportunity for those who actually know Jesus to help those who've yet to meet him or maybe those who've strayed from fellowship with him to come and live in fellowship with him. God wants to use our lives in that way. The way needed to be prepared. But also in these words, we learn a second thought today. Number two, the message needed to be preached. In verse 77 through the first part of verse 78, Zacharias added this. He said to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. So the way has to be prepared for sure, but the message has to be preached as well. John the Baptist told everyone that Jesus was coming and and that they were to look to his tender mercy. That's what John said for salvation, spiritual salvation. Now, we don't tell people Jesus is is coming in the sense that John did. We believe he's coming again. But but at Christmas, uh, our message is this. Jesus did come. He has come, and and he still has mercy for us so that we can be saved spiritually. I want you to know today, nobody is beyond the reach of God. Nobody is outside of the scope of God's love. Nobody is irredeemable, and anyone who comes humbly to God asking for forgiveness of sin, they're going to find that God has enough mercy to cover every one of us. It matters not who we are or what we've done. God's mercy never gets old, it never gets all used up, it never goes out of date or expires. In fact, in in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, the Bible says it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, John the Baptist and us, we're on opposite ends of Jesus. Opposite ends. John said, He's coming. And we said, he has come, but we both have the same job. We're to point people to Jesus. It was John, when he introduced the Lord in John chapter 1, who said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I looked that word behold up. I think we all pretty much know what it means, but I thought, I really want to know what it means. Behold so I looked it up, there were words in the definition, words like look, listen, pay attention. But in the dictionary, each of the words used to define the word behold had an exclamation point behind them. In other words, John didn't say behold. This was an impassioned, hey, look here, he's over there. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about my agenda or my objective or my goals. It is all and always all about Jesus Christ. That's to be our message. It's about Jesus. Years ago, I was in the Philippines, and I had an opportunity to preach an awful lot. In fact, I think I preached in a span of three days ten times. And uh, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I love the Philippines. And uh, I preached in some big churches and some little churches and city churches and country churches. And, and uh, it was great. I, I remember one church. I, I did my best to stand and preach. And, and uh, when I was done, it was the custom of that church that if they had a guest speaker, uh, he would stand in the back and every single person in the church would walk by, shake his hand, say, you know, thanks for coming, things like that. And, and uh, that was their custom. So I stood in the back and uh, everybody walked by. And uh, I, I said, hello, hi, hi, hello, how are you, good, thank you, you know, they walked by. One uh, lady came, elderly lady, uh, she wasn't stricken in years, but pretty close, okay? Um, she came by, and she had a book, and she asked me to sign, sign her book. Well, I looked down, and I saw on the book, the author was Paul Chapel. I am not Paul Chapel. I am Steve Chapel. My brother is Paul Chapel. all right? And uh, so she hands me this book to sign, and I'm like, well, what do I do now? And uh, so I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm not Paul Chapel. That's, that's my brother. And uh, she was trying to wrap her mind around this, and she just looked at me with utter disgust. Well, like, who are you then? You know, if you're not this guy, I've been, I came today to hear this guy, and that's not who you are. She was so disappointed in, in me, and that happens sometimes, you know. But uh, it, it, it was disappointing for her. It was kind of disappointing for me to say, ma'am, listen, I know you came to see somebody. I'm not that somebody. I'm so, I'd have rather heard him too, you know. But uh, I, I got to admit, that, that's, that's not who I am. I want you to know John the Baptist was not disappointed to say, hey, it's not me. 
It's not about me. He was ecstatic to tell the people that his ministry was not all about himself. It was all about Jesus Christ from a selfless heart. He was faithful to keep the message about the Lord. And for that reason, God used him to change the world. Christian today, church family today, it's not about us. It's not about our name. We're not trying to build a kingdom unto ourselves. We're trying to do everything within our power to elevate, to exalt the person and work of Jesus Christ. Why I'm so excited about Christmas season is it's one of the best times in the year for us to go to our friends and family, neighbors and coworkers, and say, hey guys, we're doing something special at our church. I think you're going to enjoy it. There's going to be beautiful music. There's going to be some fun things going on for the kids. Why don't you come out and share the day with us? We can get a bite of lunch together afterwards. And I think it's a beautiful thing when we, we exercise every opportunity to prepare the way and to make sure that the message can be heard. Finally, as we look here, we see this. The third thought I'll share with you today. The people needed peace. They needed peace. You know, God does nothing by chance, and the timing of the ministry of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus Christ, it was choreographed perfectly. And the world at that time was a dark place. It was a tough moment, especially for Jewish people. They were living under the rule of Rome, surrounded by people that hated them, and even in the opening words of Zacharias we read a moment ago, there was kind of a misunderstanding among those awaiting the Messiah. They thought he'd come and just kill all their enemies, but that's not what Jesus did. He did something different than, than they expected, but, but they were hopeful for that because they were living in really a tough, tough situation. And John the Baptist brought a message of peace to hurting hearts. Now, he was a strong preacher. Like, he wouldn't get much airtime on TV preaching shows today in America, okay? He was a strong preacher. He wasn't afraid to name sins. In fact, he knew one guy did specific sins. He preached a message right to that one guy and named him. Uh, he was a straight shooter, but he was a compassionate man. And ultimately, his message was all about hope in, in God and, and redemption through faith in, in the work of Jesus. But we know that uh, he wanted to help people. In the words of Zacharias in the end of verses 78 and 79, we read this. Whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. You've probably heard someone say before, I'm just, I'm just in a dark place right now. A dark place. Well, John's message was this, hey, Jesus is the day spring. In other words, he was saying he's like the sunrise. I, I know it's dark right now, but he said Jesus is, is coming. His ministry is going to begin, and he's like the sunrise. The darkness will fade. Spiritually, you can be made new. Friends, Jesus, he provides the light, but it's a whole lot more than that. I want you to know of Jesus Christ. He doesn't just provide the light. He is the light. In John chapter 9, Jesus said this, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And listen, friends, I want to lead our church in understanding the great privilege and honor it is for us together to work in such a way where we can prepare the way for people to meet Jesus so that we can participate in getting a message out that will help people to come to know Jesus. And I want us to see the privilege that is ours of sharing peace and light to those living in pressure in darkness. I've heard of parents who try to live vicariously through their kids. And it can get perverse pretty quickly when they try to find their joy as a parent through their kids doing the things they didn't get to do, and it, it can become very self-serving. It wasn't that way with John the Baptist. And as we look at what John the Baptist did, it, it doesn't have to be that way with us. We, we can see that God uniquely called him, but we can also learn from his example and carry on that work in our day. I'm not a negative guy. Our world is a total mess. Like, I don't want to be negative today, but think of all the controversial things we're arguing about in America while Russia's pushing up the Ukraine and China's amassing a navy that surpasses ours, at least in numbers, and our world's a mess. It's a tinderbox. I don't know how many Christmases until Jesus comes again. Now, they said that when I was a young guy. 
Maybe one of these kids who's up here singing will replace me one day, and they'll say the same thing. I just happen to believe. I have no idea how much time we have left. John had a sense of urgency. Now I'm going to do all I can for the glory of God to make it as easy as possible for people to come to a place where they can hear a message that will allow them to know of God's peace in their lives. If ever there was a moment in my lifetime, this is it. Do you remember, do you remember our big Christmas Sunday last year? Oh yeah, we didn't have one. Muscle memory fades quickly. Wouldn't it be a shame if this was the Christmas where we would look back and say, that was the Christmas America decided we're not going to do it that way anymore. We took a year off and we're not going back. It's time for us to boldly stand up and say, you know that, that Jesus that was born 2,000 years ago, he's God the Son. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross, not for any sins he had done, but to pay the sin debt for the world. And it's only through faith in him that we can know the joy, the forgiveness of sins, and the assurance of a home in heaven. Hang on. If you believe in heaven, say amen. There's a hell also. We want to see people saved from sins and the consequence of sins, which is an eternity separated from God in the awful place called hell so they can know the peace of God and spend eternity in heaven with Him. I'm not being melodramatic today. I just happen to believe this Bible from cover to cover. I even believe the cover when it says Holy Bible. And this is our time, this is our place, and we're His people here. And this is our week to play the role of John the Baptist. Prepare the way for people to come, to participate in getting the message out and helping people to know the peace that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can bring to our hearts and lives to give them the assurance that one day He is coming again and He will rule and reign and it will be a great time of peace. Everyone wonders, what are you going to get for Christmas? I wonder, what are we going to give for Christmas? What are we going to give? This is our time. Imagine the impact that one man named John the Baptist had in his lifetime. And then I want you to imagine with me the impact that we could make if we made the decision to point those around us to the reason for this season. And that reason has a name. It's Jesus Christ. A father, we're grateful to have watched a father go through a time where his mouth was closed he couldn't say anything and then to see you loose his tongue and the first thing to come out to be praise and lord we're grateful to see the heart that this father had for his son and even as his son was an infant he's he's praying over his son as he praises god and and lord we're thankful for john the baptist the courage he had the clarity he had in his message and lord i pray that we would be like him in the sense that we're just doing our best to prepare people to come to know Jesus, that we're participating together and getting that message out and that we're sharing the peace that only He can bring. And Lord, Lord, in this world of absolute and abject chaos and confusion, I pray that we would give a clarion call for peace that comes from the Lord. Help us, God. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.